Hi, everyone. We have a special uh, program today. We are joined by Dinesh Nirmal, who is VP of Development at Analytics for Analytics at the IBM company. And um, Dinesh has an extremely broad perspective on what's going on in this part of the industry. And, and IBM has a very broad portfolio. So between the two of us, I think uh, we can cover a lot of ground today. So Dinesh, welcome. Oh, thank you, George. Great to be here. So um, just to frame uh, the discussion, I wanted to, to hit on sort of four key highlights. Um, one is balancing the um, compatibility across cloud on-prem and edge uh, versus leveraging specialized services that might be on any one of those platforms. Right. Um, and then uh, harmonizing and simplifying both the management and the development mm -hmm. of services across these platforms. You have that trade-off between right. do I do everything compatibly or you know, can I take advantage of platform specific stuff? Right. And then um, we've heard a, a huge amount of a noise on machine learning mm -hmm. um, and everyone says they're democratizing it. Right. We want to hear your perspective on, on how you think that's most effectively done. Sure. And then um, uh, if we have time, uh, the how to manage um, machine learning feedback, data, f data feedback sure. loops sure. to improve the models. Sure. So having, uh, having started with that, um, I mean, so you, yeah. you talked about you know the private cloud and the public cloud, yeah. and then how do how do you manage you know the data and the models or the other analytical assets across the hybrid nature of today? So if you look at our enterprises, yeah, it's a hybrid uh, you know format that most customers adopt. I mean, you have some data in the public side, but you have your mission critical data that's very core to your transactions exist in the private cloud. Now how do you make sure that you know the data that you push onto cloud that you can go use to build models and then you can take that model deploy it on prem or on public cloud. Is okay. that is that the um, emerging sort of mainstream design pattern where mission critical systems are less likely to move for latency for the fact that they're fused to their own hardware but that you take the data and the researching for the models happens up in the cloud, right. and then that gets pushed down close to where the de transaction decisions are. Right, I mean, so th there's also the economics of data that comes into play. So if you are doing a you know, large-scale neural net where you have GPUs and you want to do uh, deep learning, obviously you know, it might make more sense for you to push it into cloud and be able to do that using Watson or one of the other deep learning frameworks out there. But then you have your core transactional data that includes your customer data, you know, or your customer medical data, which I think some customers might be reluctant to push onto public cloud, and then, but you still want to build models and predict and all those things. So I think it's a hybrid nature, depending on the sensitivities of the data. Customers might decide to put it on cloud versus private cloud, which is in their premises, right? So then how do you serve those customer needs? making sure that you can build a model on public cloud and then you can uh, deploy that model on private cloud or vice versa, right? I mean, you can build that model on private cloud or, or on your on-prem and then deploy it on, on your public cloud. Now the challenge, one last statement, is that people think, well, once I build a model and I deploy it on public cloud, then it's easy because it's just an API call at that time just to call that model to execute the transactions. But that's not the case. You take support vector machine, for example, right? That still has vectors in there. That means your data is there, right? So it's, even though you're saying you're deploying the model, you still have sensitive data there. So those are the kind of things that customers need to think about before they go deploy those models. So I might, this is a, a topic actually for our Friday interview with um, a member of the Watson IoT family, sure. but um, it's not so black and white when you say we'll leave all your customer data with you um, and we'll work on the models because it's sort of like tea bags, you know, you can uh, you can take the customer's tea bag and squeeze some of the tea out right. um, 
in your IBM or public cloud right. and give them back the teabag, but you're getting some of the benefit of this data. Right, so it depends, you know, depends on the algorithms you build. I mean, you could take a linear regression and you don't have the challenges that I mentioned in support of vector machine because none of the data is moving, it's just a model. So it depends, I think that's where, you know, pre canned pipelines like which Watson has done will help tremendously because the data is secure in that sense. But if you're building on your own, it's a different challenge. You have to make sure you pick the right algorithms to do that. Okay, so um, l let's move on to um, the, the modern sort of what we call operational analytic pipeline. Sure. Um, where you know the key steps are ingest, process, analyze, right. predict, serve, and, and you can drill down on those and make sure. them more fine grained. Right. Um, today there's, uh, those pipelines are pretty much built out of multi-vendor components. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that evolving mm -hmm. um, under pressures of, you know, or uh, sort of the tension between simplicity mm -hmm. coming from one vendor, mm -hmm. one throat to choke and the pieces all designed together, mm -hmm. and the specialization where you want to have a you know, unique tool in one component? Right, so you, you're exactly right. You can take a two-prong approach. One is to you can go to a cloud provider and get each of these services and you stitch it together. That's one approach. A challenging approach, but that has its benefits, right? I mean, you bring some core strengths from each vendor into it. The other one is the integrated approach where you have ingest the data, you shape or cleanse the data, you get it prepared for analytics, you build the model, you predict, you visualize. I mean, that all comes in one. The benefit there is that you know you get the whole stack in one. You have one throat to choke. Uh, you have a whole pipeline that you can execute. Uh, you have one service provider who's giving you the services. It's managed. So all those benefits comes with it, and that's probably is the preferred way where it's integrated all together in one stack. I think that's the path most will go towards, because then you have the whole pipeline available to you and also the services that comes with it, right? So any updates that comes with it, and how do you make sure, if you take the first path, the one challenge you have is that how do you make sure that all these services are compatible with each other? How do you make sure they're compliant? So if you're an insurance company, you want it to be HIPAA compliant. Right. Are you going to individually make sure that each of the services are HIPAA compliant? But once you get it from a one integrated vendor, you can make sure that they are HIPAA compliant, the tests are done, so all those benefits, to me, outweigh you going, putting unmanaged service all together and then creating a data lake to sit underneath all of it. Would it be fair to say, like to use an analogy where Hadoop being sort of uh, originating in many different Apache projects is a quasi multi-vendor kind of pipeline mm -hmm. and um, this, the state of uh, the state of the machine learning analytic pipeline mm -hmm. is still kind of multi-vendor today. Mm -hmm. um, you see that moving towards single single vendor pipeline. Who do you see as the as the sort of the last man standing? Um, so, I mean, I can speak from an IBM perspective. I would say. The benefit that a company like a vendor like IBM brings forward is like so the f the the different um, uh, public or private cloud or hybrid, you obviously have the choice of going to public cloud. You can get the same service on public cloud, so you get a hybrid experience. So that's one aspect of it. Then you get the integrated solution all the way from ingest to visualization. You have one provider. It's well tested. It's integrated. You know it's compliant. It works well together. So, so I would say, going forward, if you look at from purely from an enterprise perspective, um, I would say integrated solutions is the way to go because that's what will the, will be the last man standing. I'll give you an example. I was with a major bank in Europe about a month ago, and I took them through our data science experience, our machine learning project, and all that. And you know, the CTO stake was that Dinesh, I got it. Um, Building the model itself, it only took us two days. But incorporating that model into our uh, existing infrastructure, it has been 11 months, we haven't been able to do it. So that's the challenge our enterprises face. 
and they want an integrated solution to bring that model into their existing infrastructure. So that's you know that's my thought. So today though, um, let's talk about the IBM pipeline. Spark is core compute. Mm -hmm. um, Ingest is um, often Kafka. Right. So you can do Spark streaming. Right. You can use uh, Kafka or you can use Infosphere Stream, which is our proprietary tool. Right. To ingest. Um, Although you wouldn't really use Spark structured streaming for ingest because of the back pressure. Right, right. And so they are, yeah, the, I agree. The, the point that I'm trying to make is it's still multi-vendor, mm -hmm. and then the serving side, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, where where once a, the analysis is done and predictions are made, mm -hmm. um, s some sort of NoSQL database or or new SQL database has to take over. Right. So it's today it's still pretty multi-vendor. Right. How do you see any of those products broadening their footprint so that the number of pieces decreases? Mm. So, good, good question. They are all going to get into the end-to-end -end pipeline because that's where the value is. Unless you provide an integrated end-to-end -end solution for a customer, you know, especially enterprise customer, it's all about putting it all together. And putting these pieces together is not that easy. Even if you ingest the data, IoT kind of data, a lot of times, or 99% of the time, data is not clean. Uh, I mean, unless you're in a Kaggle competition yeah. where you get cleansed data, in real world that never happens, right? So then, I would say 80% of a data scientist's time is spent on cleaning the data, shaping the data, preparing the data to build that pipeline. So for most customers, it's critical that they get that end-to-end, well-oiled, well-connected, integrated solution than take it from each vendor, you know, uh, a very isolated solution. So answer your question, yes, every vendor is going to move into, you know, the ingest, data cleansing piece, transformation, and then building that pipeline, and then visualization. If you look at those five steps, it has to be together. But just building the, the data cleansing and transformation, having it in your, you know, native to your own pipeline, that doesn't sound like it's going to solve the problem of messy data that needs, you know, human supervision to clean right. up. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, so there is some level of human supervision that needs to make sure. So I'll give you an example. Right. I mean, when uh, data from an insurance company comes, a lot of times uh, the gender could be missing. How do you know if it's a male or female? Then you got to build another model to say, you know, if mm -hmm. this. A uh, patient has gone for a prostate exam. Yeah. He's, a, you know, it's a male. A gynecologic exam is a female. So you have to do some intuitory work in there to make sure that the data is clean, and then there's some human supervision to make sure that uh, this is good to build models. Because when you're executing the pipeline in real time, yeah, you know, it's it, it's all based on the past data. So you want to make sure that data is as clean as possible to train that model that you're going to go execute on. So l let me ask you, um, turning to a, sl uh, a slide we've got about complexity and uh, first for developers and then second for admins. If we take the, the steps in the pipeline as ingest, process, analyze, predict, serve, um, and sort of products or product categories as Kafka, Spark, mm -hmm. Streaming and mm -hmm. SQL, a web service, you know, for predict, and MPP SQL or mm -hmm. uh, NoSQL for serve. Mm -hmm. um, even if they all came from IBM, mm -hmm. would it be possible to um, unify the data model, the addressing and namespace? And I'm just ticking off mm -hmm. a few that I, you know, I, I, I can think of programming model, persistence, transaction model, workflow, testing integration. I mean, there's one thing to say it's all IBM, and then there's another thing so that the developer working with it sees it as as one suite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it has to be well integrated, and that's the benefit that IBM brings forward because we obviously test each segment to make sure that it works with well. But when you talk about complexity, Building the model is one, you know, the development of the model, but now the complexity also comes into the deployment of the model. Now right. we talk about the management of the model where how do you monitor it, right? When was that model deployed? Was it deployed in test? Was it deployed in, in, in production? 
and who changed that model last? You know, what was changed in there? And how is it scoring? Is it scoring high or low? And you want to get notification when the model starts scoring low. So the complexity is all the way across, all the way from getting the data, bringing the data in, cleaning the data, developing the model, and then deploying the model, it never ends. And the other benefit that IBM has added is the feedback loop, right? Where it, when we talk about it complexity, it reduces the complexity. So today, if the model scores low, you have to take it offline, retrain the model based on the new data, and then redeploy it. Usually for enterprises, there's you know slots where you can take it offline, put it on back online, all those things. So it's a cumbersome process. But what we have done is that we have added a feedback loop where we are training the model real time using real time data. So the model is continuously being online trained. learning. Online learning and challenger champion uh, or A/B testing to see which one is more robust. Right, so you can do that. I mean, you could have multiple models where you can do A-B testing, but in this case, you can continuously train the model to say, okay, this model scores the best, and then, and the other benefit is that if you look at the whole machine learning process, there's the data, there's the development, there's the deployment. On the development side, more and more it's getting commoditized, meaning, you know, picking the right algorithm. There's a lot of tools, including IBM, where oh, yeah. we can say, you know, linear regression is the right one for you to use for this. So that piece is getting a little more less complex, I don't want to say easier, but less complex. But the data cleansing and the deployment piece is, you know, to enterprises when you have thousands of models, how do you make sure that you deploy the right model? So you might say that the, um, that the pipeline for managing the model mm -hmm. is separate from the sort of original data pipeline, maybe it includes the same technology, or s much of the same technology, but um, once your pipeline, your data pipeline's in production, the model pipeline has to keep cycling through. Exactly, yeah, I mean, okay. the, so the data pipeline could be changing. So if you take a loan example, right, a lot of the data that comes into the loan that goes into the model pipeline is static. I mean, my age, it's not going to change every day. I mean, it is, but. Yeah you know, the age that goes into my salary, my race, my gender. Those are static data that you can take from a data and put it in there. But then there's also real-time data that's coming, my loan amount, my credit score, all those things. So how do you bring that data pipeline between real-time and static data into the model pipeline so the model can predict accurately and based on the score dipping, you should be able to retrain the model using real-time data. I want to take uh, Dinesh um, to the issue of a multi-vendor stack again and the administrative challenges. So here, you know, we look at a slide that shows, again, just me rattling off some of the admin challenges, governance, performance monitoring, scheduling orchestration, availability and recovering, authentication, mm -hmm. authorization, resource isol isolation, e elasticity, logging, testing integration. Mm -hmm. So that's the y-axis. Mm -hmm. And then for every different product in the pipeline as the x-axis, say Kafka, Spark, Structured Streaming and SQL, Web right. Service, MPP SQL, NoSQL. Mm -hmm. So you got a, a, a mess. Right. Now, um, most open source companies are trying to make um, life, they're trying to make life easier for customers by managing their software as a service right. for the customer, right. and that's typically how they monetize. Right. But tell us right. what you see the problem is, or right. will be if, with that approach. So, great question. Let me take a very simple example. You know, probably most of our audience know about GDPR, which is the European law to write to forget, right? So if you're an enterprise and I come to you and say, George, I want my data deleted, you have to delete all of my data within a period of time. Now that that's where a, one of the aspects you talked about with governance comes in. How do you make sure you have governance across your, not just data, but your analytical assets, right? So if you're using a multi-vendor solution, in all of that stack, let's take governance, how do I make sure that that data get deleted by all these services that's all tied together? Let me maybe make a, an analogy. On CSI, um, when they pick up something at the crime scene, right. they got to make sure that it's bagged right. and the chain of custody 
doesn't you know lose its integrity all the way back to the evidence room. Exactly. I assume you're you're talking about something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Something similar where the data as it moves between private cloud, public cloud, the analytical assets that's using that data, all those things need to work seamlessly for you to execute that particular transaction to delete Dinesh's data from everywhere. So right? that's, it's not just administrative costs, but this is uh, regulations that are pushing towards more homogenous platforms. Right, right, and okay. then, you know, even if you take some of the other things on the stack, monitoring, logging, metering, I mean, the platform provides some of those capabilities, but you have to make sure when you put all these services together, how are they going to integrate all together, right? You have one monitoring stack. Yeah. So if you're pulling, you know, your IoT kind of data to do a data center, or your whole stack evaluation. How do you make sure you're getting the right monitoring data across the board? Those are the kind of challenges that you will have. It's funny you mention that because um, we were talking to um, an old Lotus colleague of mine who was CTO of IBM's, uh, mm. IBM, of Microsoft's IT organization. And we were talking about how the cloud vendors can put a machine learning uh, uh, application, a machine learning management application across their properties mm. or their services. Mm. But he said one of the first problems you'll encounter is the telemetry. Like it's really easy on hardware, you know, CPU utilization, right. memory utilization, right. uh, noisy neighbor for I.O. Mm. But as you get higher up in the application services, it becomes much more difficult to harmonize so that um, a program can figure out what's going wrong. Right, right, uh, I mean like anomaly detection, yes. right? I mean how do you make sure that you are seeing patterns where you can predict something before it happens, right? And and is that on is that on the roadmap for? Yeah, so we are already working with you know some big customers to say if you have a data center, uh, how do you look at patterns to predict you know what can go wrong in the future? Root cause analysis, I mean that is a a huge problem to solve. So now let's say a customer hit a problem, you took an outage, what caused it? Because today you have specialists who will come and try to figure out what the problem is, but can we use machine learning or deep learning to figure out, you know, is it a fix that was missing or an application got changed that caused the CPU spike, that caused the outage. So the root cause analysis is the one that's the hardest to solve because you are talking about people's, you know, decades worth of knowledge. Now you are, you know, influencing a machine to do that prediction. And and from my understanding, the root cause analysis is most effective when you have a really rich model of how your, in this case, data center infrastructure and, and apps are working. And there might be many little models, but they're held together by like a some sort of knowledge graph oh, yeah. that says Here's here's where all the pieces fit, above these other pieces, below these, you know, um, uh, sort of as peers to these other things. How does that knowledge graph get built in? And is this the next generation version of a configuration management database? Right. So, I call it the self-healing, the self-managing, uh, self-fixing data center. It's easy for you to turn up the you know heat or AC when the temperature goes down. I mean that those are good, but the real value for a customer is exactly what you mentioned: building up that knowledge graph from different models that all comes together. But the hardest part is that how do you predicting an anomaly is one thing, but getting to the root cause is a different thing because at that point now you're saying. I know exactly what's caused this problem, right? And I can prevent it from happening it again. That's not easy. And we are working with customers to figure out, you know, how do we get to the root cause analysis, but it's all about building the knowledge graph with multiple models coming from different systems. Today, I mean, enterprises have, you know, they have different systems from multi-vendors. We have to bring that, all that monitoring data into one source, and that's where the knowledge graph comes in and then different models will feed that data, and then you need to prime that data using deep learning algorithms, neural nets, to say, what caused this? Okay, so this actually sounds extremely relevant, although we're probably, in the interest of time, gonna have to dig down on that one another time, but it, just at a high level, it sounds like 
the knowledge graph is sort of your your web or directory into how uh, local mm -hmm. components or, or, or local models work. Mm -hmm. And then knowing that if it sees problems coming up here, mm -hmm. it can understand how it affects mm -hmm. something else tangentially. And so think of knowledge graph as a neural net because you know it's just building new neural nets okay. based on the past data and it's it it has that built-in knowledge where it says okay you know these symptoms seem to be a problem that i have encountered in the past now i can predict the root cause because i know this happened in the past so it's kind of like using that net to build new uh, problem determinations as it goes along so it, it's, a, it's a complex task. It's okay. not easy to get to root cause analysis, but that's something we are aggressively working on in analytics. Okay, so uh, let me ask, um, let's talk about uh, um, um, sort of democratizing m machine learning mm -hmm. and the different ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. you've, you've actually talked about the, the, the big pain points, maybe not so sexy, but that are critical, which is operationalizing the models, mm -hmm and preparing the data. Um, let, me, let me bounce off you some of the other approaches. One that we have um, heard from Amazon is that they're saying, well, data munging might be you know, an issue and operationalizing the models might be an issue, but the biggest issue in terms of making this developer ready is we're going to take the machine learning we use to run our business, mm -hmm. whether it's merchandising fashion, um, running recommendation engines, managing fulfillment or logistics, and just like they did with AWS, they're dogfooding it internally, mm -hmm. and then they're going to put it out on, on AWS as a new layer on the platform. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that being effective and, right. and where less effective? Right. So let me answer your first part of the question, the democratization of machine learning. So that happens when, for example, a real estate agent who has no idea about machine learning be able to come and predict the house prices in his area, right? That's to me is democratizing because at that time you have made it available to everyone, everyone can use it. But that comes back to our first point, which is having that clean set of data. You can build all the pre-canned pipelines out there, but if you're not feeding the right set of data into it, none of this, you know, garbage in, garbage out, that's what you're going to get. So when we talk about democratization, it's not that easy and simple because you can build all these pre-canned pipelines that you have used in-house for your own purposes, but every customer has very unique cases. So if I take you as a bank, your fraud detection methods is completely different than me as a bank. My limits for fraud detection could be completely different. So there is always customization that's involved. The data that's coming in is different. So while it's a buzzword, I think there is knowledge that people have to feed in. There's models that needs to be tuned and trained. And there's deployment that is completely different. So, so you know, there is work that has to be done. Okay, so then what I'm taking away from what you're saying is you don't have to start from ground zero with your data, but you might want uh, to add some of your data which is um, specialized or slightly different from what the pre-trained model is. Right. You still have to worry about operationalizing it. And so it's not a pure developer-ready API, right. but it up-levels the up levels the skills requirement yeah. so that it's not quite as demanding as working with TensorFlow or something like that. Right, right. I mean, so you can always build the pre-canned pipelines and make it available, right? So we have already done that. So you can, for, for example, fraud detection, we have pre-canned pipelines. For IT analytics, we have pre-canned pipelines. So it's nothing you know, new, you can always do what you have done in-house and make it available to the public or the, you know, or the customers. But then they have to take it and have to do customization to meet their demands, bring their data to retrain the model. All those things has to be done. It's not just about providing the model, but every customer use case is completely different. Whether, you know, you are looking at fraud detection from a one bank perspective, not all banks are going to do the same thing. Same thing for, predicting, for example, you know, the loan, right? I mean, your loan approval process is going to be completely different than 
me as a bank loan approval process. So, so let me ask you then, just to, uh, and we're we're getting uh, low on time here, but um, what would you, if you had to characterize um, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google, um, Amazon, as each bringing um, to bear certain advantages and disadvantages, and you're now the ambassador, so you're not a representative of IBM. Help us understand the sweet spot for each of those. Um, like, you know, you're trying to fix the two sides of the pipeline, I guess, thinking of, think of it like a barbell. Yeah. You know, where, where are the others, um, uh, based on their data assets and their tools, where do they need work? Hmm. So, um, there's two aspects to it, right? I mean, there's the enterprise aspect to it. So, as an enterprise, I would look to say, it's not just about the technology, but there's also the services aspect. If my model goes down in the middle of the night, and my banking app is down, who do I call? You know, if I'm using a service that's available on, you know, on the cloud provider, uh, which is open source, do I have the right amount of coverage to call somebody and fix it, right? So there's the enterprise capabilities, availabilities, reliability, that is different. Then a developer comes in, has a CSV file that he or she want to build a Qt model to predict something. That's different, this is different, two different aspects. So if you talk about you know all these vendors, if I'm wearing an enterprise hat, some of the things I would look is that can I get an integrated solution end to end on the machine learning pipeline. And, and that means end to end in one location so you don't have right. you know, network issues or latency and stuff like that. Right, it's an integrated solution where I can bring in the data, there's no challenges with latency, all those things. And then can I get the enterprise level service, SLA, all those things, right? So, so in there, the named vendors always, obviously have an upper hand because you know, they are preferred to enterprises than a brand new open source that would come along. But then there's within enterprises, there are a line of businesses building models using you know, some of the open source vendors, which is okay, but eventually they have to get deployed. And then how do you make sure you have that enterprise capabilities on there? So if you ask me, I think each vendor brings some level of capabilities. I think the benefit IBM brings in is one, you, know, you have the choice. You have the choice or the freedom to bring in cloud or on-prem or hybrid. You have all the choices of languages, like you know we support R, Python, Spark. I mean Scala, Spark ML, you know, so SPSS. So I mean, the choice, the freedom, the reliability, the availability, the enterprise nature. That's where IBM comes in and differentiate, and that's for our customers is a huge plus. Well, one last question, and we're, we're just we're really out of time. Um, in in terms of thinking about a unified pipeline. Um, when we were at Spark Summit, and sitting down with Matei Zaharia and, mm -hmm. and um, Reynolds Shin, mm -hmm. you know, the question came up, you know, you, you, the Databricks has an incomplete pipeline, mm -hmm. you know, no persistence, um, no ingest, um, not really much in the way of serving, but boy are they good at, you know, data uh, transformation and munging and, and uh, um, the machine learning. Um, but they said they consider it part of their ultimate responsibility to take control. Mm -hmm. And you know, on the ingest side, it's Kafka. The serving side you know, might be Redis or mm -hmm. something else. Or the Spark databases like Snappy Data and Splice Machine. Mm -hmm. um, Spark is so central to IBM's efforts. Mm -hmm. What might a unified Spark pipeline look like? Have you guys thought about that? Mm -hmm. It's not there yet. I mean, you know, obviously they probably could be working on it. But for our purpose, Spark is critical for us. And the reason we invested in Spark so much is because of the execution engine. Where you can take you know, a tremendous amount of data and you know, crunch through it in a very short amount of time. That's the reason why we also invest in Spark SQL because we have a a good chunk of customers still use SQL heavily. We put a lot of uh, work into the Spark ML 
right? So we are continuing to invest, and probably they will get to an integrated end-to-end -end solution, but it's not there yet. But as it comes along, we will adopt. If it, if, if it meets our needs and demands and the enterprise capabilities, definitely. I mean, you know, I mean, we saw that Spark, uh, the core engine, has the ability to you know, crunch through tremendous amount of data, so we are using it. I mean, 45 of our internal products use Spark as our core engine. Our DSX, data science experience, has Spark as our core engine. So, yeah, I mean, you know, today it's not there, but I know they're probably working on it, and if there are elements of this whole pipeline that comes together that is convenient for us to use, and it's at an enterprise level, we will definitely consider using it. Okay. On that note, Dinesh, thanks for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, my name's George Gilbert. I'm with Dinesh Narmal from IBM, VP of Analytics Development. And we are at the Cube uh, studio in Palo Alto, and we will be back uh, in the not too distant future with more interesting uh, inter interviews with uh, some of the gurus at IBM. Stop.